video, we are going to explore the mysterious disappearance of Trevor Dealey. Trevor Dealey was a young computing graduate working in the Bank of Ireland in Dublin. He went missing after a Christmas party in December 2000 and was never seen again. In this article in the journal.ie, his family describe him as being just a brilliant person. They say that they still really miss him and that they've never given up hope. Friends, family and colleagues alike describe Trevor as a man who would do anything for anyone. He was a great friend, a great son, a great brother. He was kind hearted. He was fun. He was genuine. So what did happen to Trevor on that fateful night in December 2000? Trevor was born on the 15th of August in 1978. He was the youngest of four siblings. He had one brother and two sisters. He grew up with his brother and sisters and parents in Nace in County Kildare in Ireland, and he had a loving and secure, happy childhood. After school, Trevor went to Waterford Institute of Technology where he studied business, but it soon transpired that business wasn't for him and he dropped out. He relocated to Dublin, where he studied computer science, and he took to the discipline like a duck takes to water. He had finally found his area. After Trevor graduated, he got a job in computing in the Bank of Ireland's Asset Management Division, which was located in Bagot Street, Dublin. His manager and colleagues described him as the perfect employee. He knew his job inside out. He was really helpful to his colleagues. He was good humoured, fun. He hadn't a bad word to say about anyone and no one had a bad word to say about him. On the 7th of December 2000, Trevor and his colleagues from the Bank of Ireland went to their Christmas party at the Hilton Hotel. The night ended at Buck Whaley's and Trevor went to head home around 25 past three in the morning. It was a stormy night with winds raging from 60 to 70 miles per hour. The rain was really heavy and to make matters worse, there was a taxi strike. So Trevor, like many people out on the town that night, was going to have to walk home. Trevor decided to swing by his place of employment to pick up an umbrella. Many people found this decision unusual, going back to your place of work in the wee hours of the morning after a night out. But the Bank of Ireland premises on Bagot Street was on his way home. Staff did work nights there and it was a horrible rainy night. There were no taxis. I think it makes perfect sense. Trevor was just trying to make the walk home a little bit more bearable. CCTV footage from outside the Bank of Ireland shows that about half an hour before Trevor arrived, a man in black had taken up a spot beside a pillar. Um, I've denoted this on the screen grab from the CCTV footage here with a, a red arrow. He was tucked in beside the pillar and was there about half an hour, as I said, before Trevor arrived. This screen grab from the CCTV footage shows that the man in black has now moved out from the side of the pillar onto the main street and is looking down the street. Um, I've denoted this where the red arrow is, um, almost as if he's waiting for someone. There's a sense of anticipation uh, in his body language. Trevor arrives along to the Bank of Ireland shortly and uh, it would make you wonder, uh, did this man in black know that Trevor was uh, about to arrive at the bank? Was Trevor being followed possibly in the week or two prior to his disappearance or perhaps just on that night? In this CCTV footage, we see that the man in black has left the pillar and has now approached Trevor, who is outside the Bank of Ireland, attempting to unlock the gate. The man in black engages Trevor in conversation and Trevor replies back. The exchange between the two men appears to be polite and cordial. The next screen grab from the CCTV footage of that night is the most important in my opinion. I think it reveals uh, what actually happened to Trevor. 
Trevor's back is now turned and he's attempting to lock the gate. It's almost as if he's trying to close this man off and just focus on the task ahead and, and get in and get away from this conversation. While his back is turned, the man in black literally looks him up and down. Uh, he sizes Trevor up. It's almost as if he's trying to assess whether he can take Trevor on or not. Trevor was a large, imposing guy. He was a strong man. And uh, I think this moment is very revealing about the intention of the man in black. I do think he intended to harm Trevor in some way. In this screen grab, Trevor appears to suddenly become aware that the man is looking him up and down. A lot of people say that, you know, the exchange between the two men was very comfortable. I think it was initially. And then I think trepidation began to set in on Trevor's part. He now looks around as if to say to the man, what are you looking at? And you can sense a, a slight unease and caution in Trevor's uh, body language. The man in black makes a very overt display of trying to appear like he wasn't looking at Trevor. He moves very close to the pillar. He keeps his head down. And I think that too is a, a, a very revealing uh, moment in the CCTV footage because it's almost like the man in black is trying to disguise his true intentions, which are probably not good. Um, but there's a kind of a counter sizing going on here. Trevor now, uh, when the man in black's back is turned, sizes this man up um, and it's almost as if he's thinking, who is this guy and, you know, what does this guy want? So Trevor is now inside in the Bank of Ireland building. He retrieves an umbrella and he has a chat with his colleague Carl Pender. Before Trevor leaves the Bank of Ireland, he checks his emails and he makes a couple of bullet points about things that he needs to do the next day in work. Here in this screen grab, we see him leaving the office. I, I actually prefer to use the screen grabs uh, rather than the live footage because I feel you kind of freeze some of the moments that are quite significant in terms of the body language. And here we see Trevor looking to the right, uh, almost as if he's looking for the man in black. Again, I think he had a certain amount of wariness of this man. Um, something that isn't mentioned in a lot of videos about Trevor Dealey is, and again, this could be, it's very grainy footage and sometimes it can feel like you're almost looking at an ink blot or something. But I almost felt like I could see a vehicle parked across the road in the CCTV footage and that I could, through the window of that, see a silhouette of, of one, possibly two men. Again, it's, it's probably not that. I'm less convinced about that. Uh, you know, uh, idea, but it it's just sort of the way that the shape of the shadows across the road that, that there's just kind of a silhouette of a vehicle and possibly a man. But again, I could just be I could just be imagining that particular aspect of the CCTV footage. A lot of people have remarked that as Trevor leaves the building, he pauses for a moment and tilts his head to the right. It almost appears as if he's in conversation with somebody possibly across the road. And this might tie in with my idea that perhaps there is a man that we can't see standing behind a vehicle to whom he is speaking. Again, uh, the footage is very grainy. It's very hard to make out. Um, you know, figures and shapes uh, across the road from where Trevor is standing. But it does almost appear from his body language as if he's talking to someone. Here we see Trevor heading home. This is the last image of Trevor Dealey. After this moment, Trevor literally disappeared off the face of the earth. It's a very poignant moment. Uh, it's late at night. Trevor's had a few drinks. There are no taxis. The weather is awful. Um, and, uh, you know, there's this strange man uh, lurking around the Bank of Ireland. And it's just a very poignant moment where we see a man who is potentially very vulnerable at this point. And it just does go to show that, you know, men as well as women can be very vulnerable late at night when they're out on their own. In this screen grab from the CCTV footage, we can see that a man is walking very closely behind Trevor. This could be a regular guy walking home, but I think there's something in the body language. There's a kind of a stealth in uh, the man's movements. He seems very focused looking ahead. He's walking very purposely and, uh, and keeping up with Trevor. And I, I do believe that this man is following Trevor. It could potentially be the man in black that was by the pillar or perhaps an associate, 
but uh, Trevor is uh, without a doubt being followed home. A lot of people were curious as to why Trevor went home uh, to Ballsbridge where he lived in Dublin via Haddington Road. It was a longer route. People speculated that perhaps he was going that way to get cigarettes from a 24 hour shop and that's highly plausible. I personally feel that Trevor was becoming concerned that he was being followed and he was trying to shake this man off. In this picture we see Trevor's childhood friend Glenn Cullen. They'd grown up together. They were extremely close and Glenn said that he and Trevor had never had a single row. At about quarter past four, Trevor rang Glenn and I, I think it's lovely that he was so comfortable with Glenn that he felt he could ring Glenn at quarter past four in the morning. But I suspect the real motivation for this call was that he was becoming concerned that he was being followed and he may have been seeking reassurance or perhaps just trying to display to the man pursuing him that he did have a phone and he could reach out for help if necessary. Unfortunately, Glenn was gone to bed that night. Trevor left a message that all was okay and he would ring him the next day. But again, I think this phone call uh, did indicate that Trevor was perhaps becoming uh, nervous. So let's look at some of the theories relating to Trevor's disappearance. So theory one, did Trevor commit suicide? In the week prior to uh, the Christmas party, many employees in the Bank of Ireland were taking the last few days of their annual leave and Trevor was no exception. Trevor had a couple of days left. During his studies, he'd become very friendly with a student from Alaska and by all accounts, he had developed something of a crush on her. Glenn, who worked in the airline industry, uh, said to Trevor, I, I bet you wouldn't go and see this student in Alaska. And uh, Trevor sort of took him up on his dare and said, well, actually, I would. Glenn got uh, Trevor free tickets and Trevor actually flew out to Alaska. Uh, the visit wasn't encouraged by this uh, student. She said to him that she was very busy. Uh, Trevor didn't listen. He went ahead. Uh, and took the trip. I suppose he was excited to have the free tickets as anybody would be. Um, and he arrived out uh, to Anchorage in Alaska. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the female student, she, she didn't meet with Trevor. He was essentially given the brush off. Uh, it must have been very deflating having traveled that distance. You know, it was a huge trip. Uh, but Trevor dusted himself off, he made the best of it, he went sightseeing and when he returned to Ireland uh, he told his father that he had had the trip of a lifetime. A lot of people have uh, found this trip to Alaska extremely unusual and they've thought does it indicate that Trevor started a new life somewhere else or that he was involved in something nefarious. Uh, I think that Trevor just got free tickets. Uh, he was going to go to somewhere beautiful. He was going to have the chance to catch up with somebody to, you know, with whom he was, uh, uh, you know, who he was attracted to. And uh, I, I just think that far more is made of this trip to Alaska. Uh, it, it is what it is. It was just a trip to Alaska to, to, to hopefully see a woman that he was uh, attracted to. Friends, family and colleagues describe Trevor as always being in a good mood and as always being up, as always being positive. And I've no doubt that he was all those things. Here's a photograph of Trevor out with his colleagues having an amazing time. But sometimes you can see that type of person and they are always so up. But you never know the sadnesses that they could uh, hide. Uh, perhaps some of it relates to, you know, relationships, maybe not being able to get relationships with women off the ground or whatever it may be. And we have to remember he just did have that, uh, you know, hurtful experience in Alaska. It must have been actually a very lonely experience, you know, flying home, uh, you know, the lady didn't even take an hour or two out of her time to to, to meet him. And uh, that's not casting any aspersions on her. You know, I, I, I think she may have had a boyfriend. Things may have been awkward for her. Uh, but um, I, I think that we just never know how someone can kind of handle those kind of disappointments. And I think that Trevor, you know, may have had more sadnesses than people may have supposed. But I still think in spite of that, Trevor would not have taken his own life. He had such a loving family, such a network of friends, colleagues, people who cared about him. He had everything to live for. And I just really don't think that Trevor would have taken this course of action. One thing that did strike me as a little curious is that Haddington Road is actually very close to Sandymount Beach. Um, 
I always thought that Sunnymount Beach was much further away and my sister actually lived on Haddington Road for several years and when I would visit her she would say let's go to the beach and I'd be like is that not quite far from here and she knew a great shortcut and we would walk there in 20 minutes. It did make me wonder did Trevor turn on to Haddington Road that night because he intended to continue to the sea and to end his life. We don't know what other romantic rejections Trevor may have had and perhaps uh, you know this trip to Alaska tilted him over the edge. I did wonder did Trevor uh, have an additional motivation for popping into the office that night after the party. He obviously wanted to collect an umbrella. Uh, he probably wanted to catch up with Carl and give him all the news about uh, the party. But, but but he did also check his email that night. Perhaps he also checked his personal email. Um, we've all been there when you've had romantic rejection. You know, you, you try to save face or put a brave face on it. Maybe he sent her an email saying, I did all these amazing things in Alaska trying to keep some sort of, you know, dignity, if you like, or, or even just to keep the line of communication open with this uh, woman. And perhaps she didn't reply again. And that, too, added to, you know, his uh, disappointment. But I, I still feel that Trevor didn't commit suicide. He had such a loving family, he had such a great uh, network of colleagues. He had everything to live for. So for me, I think that this theory is is very unlikely. Another theory is, could Trevor have started a new life overseas? I think that this theory is very unlikely because Trevor's passport and documentation, they were all still intact in his apartment. A friend did mention to me that perhaps Trevor took a ferry to the UK, that in those days you didn't need a passport. Um, it's possible. But again, I just think that Trevor wasn't the type of person to let his family worry. You know, he, he wouldn't have lived abroad for 10, 20 years and, and not reached out to his family. There are incredible stories. Here's one on the BBC News website. Uh, about people who've lost their memory, either being in an accident or an altercation. Uh, this is a story on the BBC News website about a man in Canada who lost his memory and uh, he wasn't identified uh, or, or reunited with his family for 30 years. Uh, I think this theory is probably unlikely in the context of Trevor, but it's certainly not impossible. But again, I think it's probably um, not the most likely theory. Some people have speculated that Trevor was the victim of a hit and run. Um, it was a stormy night. There were no taxis. Was somebody drink driving? Did they knock Trevor down and perhaps put him in the boot of a car? Uh, drove off. That weekend, the whole city was sweep clean because Bill Clinton was coming to visit. Was evidence of a crash or hit and run swept away? I think this theory is unlikely because I think that somebody would have seen something had Trevor been knocked down in the city centre. And Trevor was such a, a tall, big guy, you know, getting Trevor into the boot of car without being seen would have been really difficult. So for me, this theory is uh, not, not, a, not a runner at all. Another theory is that Trevor may have been involved in criminality. I always laugh when I see this theory. I, I think that Everyone who spoke about Trevor, uh, you know, talked about how, you know, trustworthy he was, what a dependable guy he was. Um, I just don't think that uh, Trevor would engage in criminality in any way, shape and form. And I think this is one of the more ridiculous theories. Sometimes when there is an information vacuum, people will inject all kinds of scenarios into that uh, information vacuum, if you like. I, I really think that this th this theory is, in fact, the the, the least viable of, of all the theories that, that have been put forward. For me, the most likely theory is that Trevor was targeted in relation to his role as a bank employee. There are lots of stories in the Irish news media and in the international news media about bank officials who are taken hostage. Um, I think this is possibly what happened to Trevor. Uh, here's one in the Irish Times in 2009. It describes a bank official from County Kildare. Uh, County Kildare is actually just coincidentally where, where Trevor uh, grew up. And uh, his family was held hostage and the bank official was forced to take out 7.6 million to give to what the newspaper describes as a ruthless Irish gang. Um, and, you know, sometimes the bank official can be held up by themselves 
or their family is held up or both the official and the family are held up. But my suspicion is that uh, on that night in December 2000, Trevor was uh, taken somewhere from Haddington Road, possibly to a house. And, and I think the motivation was to get money out of the bank. They saw a guy who had easy access to the bank, uh, you know, entering a bank at four in the morning. They probably didn't realise that this bank wasn't a typical bank. This was asset management. You know, it wasn't a bank that had vaults of money uh, or cash that could be readily taken. And that in itself may have uh, resulted in Trevor being harmed or, or possibly killed because he wasn't able to satisfy their demands. Something curious that did happen the day that Trevor disappeared is that the electricity went down in his apartment block. We know this because he told his father uh, this fact during a phone call that they had had that day. I did wonder, could this be connected to his disappearance? And I did a bit of Googling and apparently uh, criminals will disable the electricity to disable the alarm system. And I felt so stupid when I saw that because it's so obvious there's no electricity, uh, you've no alarm system. It did make me wonder, was Trevor being maybe watched? And uh, at this point, was he being followed? Uh, was a gang aware that his two flatmates were away that weekend? Were they going to try and get into the apartment or possibly, you know, hold him hold him up in, the, in, in his own apartment to get information out of him? Uh, it could just be a coincidence, but I, it, it's an odd occurrence on, on the day that Trevor disappeared. And it does make me wonder, uh, you know, was this a premeditated attempt to get money out of the bank um, and that this was quite a thought out planned operation? Trevor Dealey's family, who have been heroes throughout this whole process, um, have actually put up a, an incredible 100,000 reward for any information relating to Trevor's disappearance. As soon as the reward was put up, uh, a person did come forward and state that uh, Trevor had been killed by a ruthless Crumlin gang uh, uh, in an opportunistic attack on the night that he disappeared in December 2000. A final theory is that Trevor was possibly harmed or killed during a random attack, maybe a mugging, an altercation, perhaps it was a sexually motivated attack. I don't think that it's impossible, but I just think that a lot of the factors point towards uh, uh, something connected to his role in the bank. So how can Trevor's family be helped going forward? Now that uh, digitally enhanced CCTV footage is available of Trevor outside the Bank of Ireland that night, I feel that the case would really benefit from the insights of an internationally renowned body language expert. There are so many nuances in the body language in that CCTV footage. I think it could be unpacked by an expert uh, like this, and I think it could reveal a lot about what happened to Trevor on that night. Trevor's family have been outstanding in terms of the money that they've put up for the reward, but I suspect that if a criminal gang was involved in Trevor's disappearance, it's going to take a lot more than 100,000 to get the details of what happened to Trevor on that night out of this gang. 100,000 is, is, is not a huge amount of money to this type of criminal. They're involved in drug trafficking, human trafficking. I think it's going to take something closer to half a million to a million euros to get somebody to come forward. I think the 100,000 attracted a tentative approach, if you like, somebody skirting around uh, the truth of what happened, but maybe too frightened to incur the wrath of another criminal by giving the full uh, disclosure. I, I think you would probably see somebody take that risk, uh, a criminal, you know, squealing on another criminal if the money was at the right level. And also there would need to be the offer of witness protection. I, I think this money could be raised through crowdfunding and the government could also make a donation. In this article in the independent.ie, Trevor's sister states that 21 years, which is the amount of time that Trevor's been missing, is such a long time to be searching for somebody with no answers. My heart really goes out to Trevor's family. Uh, his sister has described this as a relentless nightmare and it must really truly be a relentless nightmare. 
the Garda has produced an age uh, progress photo of Trevor. I'm just including it in the slideshow on the off chance that Trevor is out there somewhere. Um, and it, it's very useful to have uh, this, this uh, visual of what Trevor might look like today. Trevor's father uh, has remained throughout the most incredible champion of uh, Trevor's case. Uh, I did see an interview that he gave 21 years after Trevor was missing, in which he says that he thinks of his son every single day. He could literally just be driving down the street and Trevor will come into his uh, mind. And he concludes the interview by saying, I just want him back. All of Trevor's family continue to search for Trevor. They are truly inspiring. Trevor's sister has said that many people ask her why do they continue to search for Trevor after all this time and she has said simply that if you knew Trevor and if the shoe was on the other foot Trevor would never give up on us. My feeling is that Trevor's disappearance uh, is connected to the man in black. I think that small micro moment in the body language in the CCTV footage where the man in black is sizing Trevor up and down. I, I do think that this reveals ill intent on the part of the man in black. And I do think that Trevor's disappearance is connected to this man. Trevor remains in the hearts and minds of people all across Ireland and all around the world. I truly hope that his family, friends and all those that cared for Trevor find out what happened to this very special and genuine man. The Trevor Dealey case remains an open and active case. If you have any information, please contact Pier Street Garda Station on 003531 666 Many thanks.